Digital 410 Productions proudly presents the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast with your hosts Don Abernathy and Jeff Copsetta. One of the greatest fears I had was would I be able to do my job because never having been under fire and never having been in the, in the stress of combat, everybody goes through that. And that was the greatest fear you had at any time was would you measure up in the eyes of your buddies. And th that was probably one of the greatest motivating factors to all of us. I think a great deal of it was based on the fact that it was so instilled in us that you can't let another Marine down. So consequently, you wanted to always measure up and do your best. The pre-landing bombardment had commenced. The din and the noise was so absolutely incredible, it's indescribable. You couldn't even yell to the man right next to you and have him hear you. I was absolutely scared to death, and so was everybody else. And I, the, the main thing that concerned me was I was afraid I was going to wet my pants. And yeah, I looked at the island, and, and all you could see, it, was, it just looked like a thin line. It was just a sheet of flame backed by just this huge black wall of smoke. And I thought, my God, none of us will ever get out of that place. All up and down the beach, shells were going off. Amtraks were getting hit on the beach before they could let the guys out. You could see guys falling all along the beach because of the extremely heavy small arms fire and artillery and waterfall. So we got in off the beach as far as we could go and hit the deck um, in the sand. And ju just, as, just before I hit the deck, I happened to look down and my right foot missed no more than by six inches. A Japanese mine that was in the form of a 500-pound bomb buried in the sand, and it had a metal pressure plate on the top of it. A little way down the, the beach, I saw a boy step on one, and he just, it just atomized him. He just disappeared. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast, a very special episode if we were to borrow phrases from the early 70s TV shows like NBC and CBS with my co-host, as you heard, Jeff Copsetta, and our very, very special guest, the one and only Henry Sledge. Jeff, Henry, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. Doing well. Couldn't be better. So as you guys just heard, that was um, a little clip you guys can find on YouTube of... Uh, the one and only Eugene Sledge talking about his experiences landing on Peleliu. And joining us tonight is his youngest son, Henry, who's going to, uh, I don't know, share some of their family's experiences with, um, you know, growing up with their father being who he is and his post-war years. And um, obviously talk about his book and how the production of the HBO Specifics come along. And uh, we've been talking for about 30, 40 minutes before the show. And now that we're live, Bailey's in the other room playing with her squeaky toy, as you can hear. Which, by the way, Henry, I was ecstatic. Last night I was reading the final chapters of uh, The China Marine. Yeah. And, and we all know that your father's dog, Deacon, passed away when he was on Okinawa. But he said when he came home, your grandmother's dog, Captain, the Boston Terrier, which I am a huge Boston Terrier fan. That's what Bailey is. Came to greet okay. him at the house. And so it warmed my heart to know that your father came home to a Boston Terrier, which was there to uh, greet him and warm his bed at night because I'm a huge I, Boston Terrier. I don't know if that dog is in this picture or not. I think Deacon's in that picture. Yeah. I um, don't know if you can see it very well. I just, I can't get over this. Jeff and I, for those of y'all following along at home, we've had the unreal experience of getting text messages of photos of uh, your father's p41 the k bar <clears throat> family photos and it's just unreal to have you here and i guess first and foremost we need to give a a big thank you to galen wagner who um has been on the yes. show uh for putting us together um i yep. guess i'll leave it to you explain to the audience how we came to be here and how you and galen got hooked up and how i got a weird text message at seven in the morning said hey would you be interested in having henry sledge on your show <laughs> uh sure <laughs> yeah so to to put some perspective on that guys um i there is a facebook group called world war ii in the pacific um i joined that or i think i was invited to join it but i joined it and the museum of the marine corps i think it was put they they do this thing called marine monday Okay. And they put a post up. I mean, I had no idea this was going to happen. This kind of stuff just happens all the time. They put a post up about my dad. It showed a picture of him in his dress blues. 
very iconic picture. <clears throat> and they had a blurb about him, about a paragraph talking about his biography in the book and all that. And that got shared onto the World War II in the Pacific Facebook group. And I went on there and looked at it and people were just really responding to it. And it, it was heartwarming to me, of course. So I put a post on there saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm EB Sledge's son. I'm, it's been suggested to me that I should do at some point in the future, do a podcast on my dad or on my, because I'm passionate about PTO history as well as just my dad's legacy. <clears throat> Would anybody be interested in that? Galen was one of the people and it was a huge response. I mean, it just blew me away, but Galen was one of the people who responded to that. And, you know, he hit like, and he put a comment and I saw his name. I knew I could tell he lived in the in mobile area, which of course I love mobile. My brother lives in Fairhope. And, he said, I've got a friend, Don Abernathy. He does a World War II podcast. I can hook you guys up. And so that that's kind of how we got to be where we are, Don. And so you and I got the chat, and then I sent Jeff a text. And Jeff, what did you think when the text message came across your phone? I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I think I was down in Crystal Beach still when, when you sent me that. And it was just, uh, yeah, you know, I, Everybody in the greatest generation is is equally important for for our success in World War II and who we are today, you know. But there are some that are sometimes a little extra special, and sometimes it's the help of a of a book or, of course, a movie that kind of helps highlight who these ordinary people were that did extraordinary things. And and you know, Henry, of course, you know your dad was definitely fell into that category as one of those extraordinary. Uh, you know, among among his generation. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, our our little podcast is, uh, you know, it's been growing and it's been really enjoyable to be able to share you know, Don and our uh, our passion. You know, to be able to talk about it with people in a podcast, you know, is it's something that a lot of people don't get to do. You know, so anytime we have a guest on here or, or whatever, it's really it, it's refreshing. You know, um, to be able to share for us to be an avenue for you to share, you know, like you said about your dad's legacy. So I'm just, I'm just proud to be a part of it. Well, Hey, I'm, I'm thank you guys for having me. I mean, like I told Don, I hope you got a lot of questions because I do better answering questions than, you know, well, absolutely. And Jeff and I are both honored to have you use our podcast as a way for you to, um, you know, determine or not whether or not you want to get into something like this. And we're, we're very grateful, but with that being said, let's get into a little bit. Um, obviously the, with the old breed, I think the first publishing was in 1981. Correct. And, and as you and I were talking off the air, obviously, you know, when that book came out, it was a huge book. And, um, but a majority of the people who read the book were people who had interest in world war two. And so what was things like when the book came out for your family, uh, for your father? I know you, you're telling us that you remember the original manuscripts, your mom was typing it up. Do you remember those times when your your mom and your dad were spending hours, I would assume, um, him, you know, looking at the Bible, which you have. Jeff, you ready yes. for this? Sh show Jeff the Bible. The Bible is sitting there on his desk. The Bible that we've all seen. Are, are we streaming on YouTube right now? Yes, we're streaming on YouTube. Okay. And so when your dad... I got it in this case. I'm sorry about that. But I this thing has been pawed over by Ken Burns, <laughs> Tom Hanks, you name it. And mom, my mom finally just said, Henry, put that thing in a case. I'm tired of people pawing through it. They're going to tear the cover off. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we, we understand why. Yep. You know, please don't say, think I say that with any irritability at all. But that that's the Bible. Well, Jeff, being someone who's worked in many museums, he can definitely understand the importance of uh, what, you know, and people don't, people don't realize this, especially when it comes to paper artifacts. Every single time you open it once you know think about comic book nerds who have that early edition of superman or spider-man or whatever they don't want to ever take it out of that plastic sleeve and because sure. they know every time a finger even with gloves on every time you open that up there's just risk involved and so definitely with something like that you got to protect right well so you were asking me if if i was reading the question right about early memories of mm -hmm. the book. i mean i can remember so when i Till when I was born until the time I was seven years old, eight years old, 
we lived in, in a house on Pine View Road in Montevallo. Then we moved to the house that where my brother and I really grew up. I remember <clears throat> being five or six years old, late at night, my dad sitting up by the fireplace, um, and he, he always wrote on legal pads. And we actually, all those legal pads are down at Auburn in the archives. I've seen them. Um, but he always wrote in pencil, yellow legal pads. And <clears throat> probably not long after he and my mom got married, which obviously would predate my brother and me, he took the pieces of paper out of the Bible and, and expounded on those notes and made an outline, okay? What I remember is getting up, late at night and coming through there in my pajamas with little footies on them, you know, dad, dad, what are you doing? And my dad's nickname for me my whole life, I don't know why, but he, he called me Big Shot. Mm -hmm. I remember saying, oh, Big Shot, I'm just sitting here working on something. And he'd be sitting there, you know, by the fireplace writing. And I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to bed, you know, and he'd send me off to bed. But uh, that was, those are the earliest memories. Um, I remember very well, you know, going to the dime store in Montevallo and getting the, the plastic bags with the soldiers, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the green plastic soldiers. Yep. And I would play with those things. And I can remember now that we would have moved at this point. So I'd be like eight years old or so. I remember being on the floor in the den playing with those little green plastic soldiers and hearing my mom in the laundry room behind the den typing the manuscript. Wow. And there was a table, this little rickety table. And I can close my eyes and still see that manuscript just piling up like this. And, you know, my brother and I would take it and read it because it was double spaced, you know, just typed on an old typewriter. And, you know, we would read it. And, of course, what my father's always said, his reason for wanting to write the book was to create a written record for my brother and me to have some understanding of what he went through in World War II because we all had an interest in military history. We had ancestors who had us to read their letters that they wrote home. And so he wanted to create something for, for the family to have some idea of what he had seen and experienced <clears throat> as a Marine. And I think it was, you know, my mom was typing this stuff and, and she, you know, she, it's well known, she said, Gene, this is pretty extraordinary. You ought to get this published. Yeah. And of course, my, you know, if, if you had known my dad, he was not a self-aggrandizing person at all. I mean, really self-effacing. Um, and he was like, no, there's no way anybody's going to want to read this, you know. But she persisted. And I remember, you know, a lot of late night conversations there was a study in our house on the second floor where um, he spent most of his time. It was on the back side of the house where I grew up and he would sit in there for hours writing, you know, the manuscript. And of course they would meet and talk about, well, we, you know, we need to get contacts. And he, he started contacting uh, some old officers that he had, he had known uh, to lend their credibility to it. Austin Schaffner being one of them. Um <clears throat> And I remember a lot of long phone conversations. Um, I remember, man, I can close my eyes and still see this huge manila envelope with the manuscript. And he had sent it to a publisher. And I remember the mail came one day and he, you know, I was, I walked up to the, to the mailbox with him and he said, takes this thing out. It was a, he said, well, this is probably a rejection. And it was a publisher sending the manuscript back saying we're not interested. Wow. I was going to ask you how many he went through before he got accepted. Third one. Wow. Third one was the charm. You know, I it, it's, it's got to be a little weird that here you are talking to two relative strangers and you talk about when your parents get married and I can pick up this book and say, well, your parents got married on March 12th, 1952. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what did your, I know from the book, China Marine, if for those of you following along at home or listening to the podcast, I'm sure most of you have read um, with the old breed pick up China Marine. This is a very good um, point period stop. It, it wraps everything up and you and I are talking about this 
that when your father sent in the original manuscript, it basically included a lot of the material from China Marine. But as right. the book saw editors, they said, okay, we, you were telling us that they had a page quota that they wanted to stick to. Wait, say that again now. You were telling me before the show that they said, hey, we want to keep this within so many pages. And Oh, yeah. So when Presidio Press, who I think has been bought by Random House, when, when they agreed to publish the book, you know, 1980-ish, um, and I can remember my dad and my mom talking about this, and they were like, well, hey, this thing's too big for the average person, you know, 300, 320 pages, something like that. Let's keep it around that. Let's have you, you know, the beginning, Peleliu, Okinawa, you come home, let's end it right there. Um, the whole part about doing China Marine, which, you know, my dad's China service, I mean, he cherished those times. That was a healing time for him. And <clears throat> I mean, really, you know, Don, you just read China Marine. It's been years since I read it. Um, that episode, that that part in there where they're on the ramparts of that fort watching the Japanese tank column go out at dusk, and my dad, and I, I, maybe I'm getting ahead of things. Maybe I no, shouldn't go into all no, that. You can go into it. Well, the reason I bring up is, one, in this book, your, your father explains that he met your mom at a friend's wedding. But yes. to, to rewind real quick to what you're getting at, I, most of, I'm a World War II guy. And Jeff, you may be the same way, but you then again, you're more military-minded. Maybe you knew. I just assumed, okay, 1945, we know from, from what the old breed, the horrible story said on Okinawa, they got to the one shore. They said, okay, turn around, walk the other direction, and clean up the battlefield and bury the dead, which your father was very resentful for. Right. Obviously. But the fact that, People don't realize that um, China had a power vacuum, kind of like we're seeing right now over the Middle East. Won't get into that. But China had a power vacuum, and you had uh, the China Nationalist Army, which was allied with the United States, and the 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 Air Force or the Army Air Corps was flying in nationalist soldiers trying to get them through northern China. But you had the Communist Party coming up, and as you're saying, here here your father was, and other members of of his you know, K three five who were assigned there, they're sitting in this fort, if you were, and the Japanese who are still there are now fighting on the side of the China nationalist. And he, the, for him and for us, the war is over, but he's got artillery flying over his head as, right. And as he said in there, I don't know what they're thinking, but for some reason, the, the China nationalists, they fire their artillery at the same exact time every night. So by clockwork, so that all the communists have to do is get in their bunkers and wait until the, the three minutes pass. But he's yeah. the war is over for him, but here he is, could very well have a short round. Uh, there were Marines over there who lost their lives in, in those skirmishes, protecting those trains. And he's watching these Japanese soldiers, Jeff, if you can imagine this, with a tank, and he's standing there with the same Thompson he had on Okinawa. How do you go from fighting an enemy for two years sleeping in foxholes with one eye open, waiting on a bonsai charge, you're conditioned to shoot when you see one. And now you got a whole platoon walking past you and you got to prevent from doing what you're trying to do, which is shoot them. Cause now all of a sudden they're on your team and he just watched them go off to fight against the, the help, the nationalist Chinese army fight against the Chinese communists. It's just <clears throat> mind blowing that it, it you're literally seeing, I mean, the way my dad described that, they're on the ramparts of the fort, it's dusk, and their orders were be locked and loaded, but you're there to just don't intervene. Don't fire unless you're fired upon. Protect yourself. And he said, you know, he writes here, they hear the, the hobble news. You know, it's a column of like 50 troops and maybe two Type 95 tanks. And, you know, the dust is stirred up, the, the tank's headlights are on, and it's cutting through the, the dust. And as the tanks pass under them and the troops are, you know, in their helmets and everything. Um, and the it's under him and, he, and, he, and the commander and one of the turrets has the turret open. He's got a ceremonial headdress, a ceremonial samurai, white gloves. And he looks up at him and salutes as he goes by. And my dad, I remember, I remember him and me talking about that. And he, you know, oh my, but we're out there going, we've been killing these SOBs for two years and now they're our allies. 
it, it was literally, if you think about it, and you've already done a great job setting it up, Don, it was the beginning of the Cold War, which defined the, the period that I grew up in. You know, I remember when the Russians went into Afghanistan in 77 and being terrified of seeing Leonid Brezhnev. I mean, I was like, man, this guy's going to drop a nuclear, you know, he's going to shoot missiles at us. But Not only were they he, the allies, but they had on the same damn uniform that he was shooting at six months before. Right. So it's not like, okay, here's Japs, but they're in, you know, uniform change. No, same uniform, same gear, same equipment. And you know, these guys have PTSD. They've had yes. nightmares. They see, they've been seeing these guys in their sleep and here they are watching them and just fighting the urge to do what they've been trained to do for years. And it's just, to me, that part was crazy, but he goes on in great detail um, about his relationships with uh, the family and the, and I want to bring this up. I know um, during your time growing up, did your father bring up the um, the preacher and the, the family that he stayed with over in China off the, on throughout your childhood, or was it just come up every mm -hmm. once in a while? I you think it's Father Marcel. So, you, you hear so many people say, well, my father, grandfather was here, there, or wherever, but he never talked about it. Okay. For whatever reason, my father was not taciturn about it at all. Okay. I mean, I can remember, and if I stray too much and try and answer your question, I apologize. No worries. But, you know, he, there, there was, what I'm trying to say is there wasn't much about it all that he didn't talk about. I mean, you know, he didn't talk about the blood and the gore when I was a little kid. Sure. But, you know, I can remember being out. In fact, there's a picture of, of me out in the yard. I was probably four years old with my little play bench set, you know, workbench in the backyard. And my dad's in the background with his HBT cap, just like you guys are wearing. <clears throat> I mean, I know that's a later model, actually, with a screen printed EGA. But he had his HBT cap, which I've got it back there in the closet behind me. And he would wear it when he'd be out in the yard doing yard work. Now, we're talking, you know, 1969, probably. Um, it's a lot more thread threadbare now, I'm sure. Know, but but I've got it. But um, you know, I can remember. But to to stick to to your question about the Chinese family, my knowledge of that was not so factual. I mean, I was aware that he had been in China after World War II. No. Yeah, it was Dr. Song, his family. Funny thing, you are talking about my hat. It's very hard to find reproductions that don't have the EGA on it, and Jeff can attest to this. I did find one. It's actually on a slow boat from China right now. I did find one on eBay the other day, and it says, no logo, because when I bought this one, this one's actually close to seven years old now. It's got rust spots on it. It's super salty from the Florida sun. It looks great, but I wish it didn't have the EGA on it, but I actually have one coming. Did World War II impressions? I think I got one from them years ago. Um, this particular one, when I first got into the hobby, I, I got this one off eBay years ago, but go ahead, Jeff, you know, you've ordered a lot of uniforms from these guys. Yeah. I mean, I, I maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought it was identical to the cover that the army was issued. No, uh, it's got a shorter bill on it and it has these, um, the army one is more rounded, whereas the Marine Corps kind of had these for lack of better term, I'm going to say, um, seams on them or inseams that kind of makes these little points whereas the mm -hmm. army one's more rounded like a baseball cap and I, the bill's I, a little shorter want, i mean i'd have to step away from the camera but i can get my dad's if you want to see it by all means all right give me give me a minute and, and that's something jeff maybe we can do on the next episode i have my army one um they are a little different believe it or not but yeah um i think the bills are a little shorter i could be wrong but they they seem to have a little bit of a different shape it could be, yeah. It could be the bill. I mean, I know you can, you can kind of shape an army to look like an eight point yeah. cover. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I know there maybe there is a difference. I thought they were quite similar. No, they, uh, they, yeah, they got a little bit different. It could be, it could be different. But um, yeah. So definitely for you guys, and we're going to get into with the old breed and, and the making of the Pacific Wow, and that's actually his his pen EJ on there. Yes. That's but it, amazing. It's, you know, it's pretty well, pretty well worn. But does it ever occur to you that these things that you have, people would just die to just remotely even have one item in their collection? Like, show show everybody at home the K bar. And I want to bring this up. Um, in the China Marine, at the very end when he gets home, he went to Camp Lejeune. He had to report. He had to fill out a document. 
and they had an itemized list of all the things that you were expected to return. And the two things that he said he intentionally did not return, he, he listed as lost in the war, was that K-Bar knife and his haversack. Did you see that haversack? Was that haversack around your house growing up? Do you guys still have the haversack? <laughs> this is mind-blowing to me. That's amazing. Can you see his name? Yeah, it's, pretty... it's, it's right there, Sledgehammer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, this stuff was, you know, again, because of... Oh, I didn't... So you want to, you guys want to... I know you want to see the forty five he carried. Now, Jeff, <laughs> you're very familiar with the HBO of the Pacific, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course, and, and Henry and I were talking about this. That is the gun that Henry's grandfather sent to his father. And now for those of you watching at home or listening to the podcast, you think, wait a minute, in the HBO of the Pacific, he was sent a revolver. And Henry and I had a very long discussion about this before we went on the air when we were doing troubleshooting. Apparently, that was a decision made by, well, according to the scuttlebutt that was passed down through Henry's connection with the production, is that was a... Uh, last minute decision allegedly perhaps made by Dick Dye. But um, Henry was explaining to me that during the production, and maybe we should back up a little bit, but anyhow, we'll, we'll get to it. He was sending photos of his dad's stuff, including that 45. And then when he yeah. went and saw the rough cut, he was as shocked as we are now. Cause I always just assumed that your grandfather sent him a 40, uh, the revolver and not, that was his grandfather's world war one issue, 1911. Well yeah, actually, you are correct. Um, it is a Springfield Armory. Um, and and somewhere around here, I don't know, we moved a little over a year ago, but I do have the document. I have the document where my grandfather went down to Mobile County Sheriff Department and got, you know, got permission from them to send this to my dad who was overseas. And I remember I, I man, I can still hear my dad talking about it. You know, we came down the gangplank of the ship when I came home because I'm like, dad, do you have your helmet? Do you, you know, what about your rifle? What about your carbine, your Tommy gun? Um, <clears throat> you know, no, no, we had to turn all that stuff in. But he said, you know, when I came down the gangplank, they had a Lieutenant there checking everybody off, making sure we didn't keep stuff. And he said, I, I had my 45 and, um, I remember him saying, I told him, sir, I, this is my personal property. I have a paper to prove me. And Lieutenant just waved him on. Yeah. Jeff, you have any particular questions about um, anything really before we get into, because Henry has some pretty interesting stuff about how the production came and his family being contacted to, um, to mm -hmm. get involved with the book, you know, with the production. But before we get into that, you have any questions for Henry? Yeah. Uh, we're like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes in this episode. I'm still starstruck. <laughs> I'm speechless, man. I'm just enjoying it's not because of me. It's good, you know. <laughs> well, to be fair, yes, it's for who your father is, but it'd be like a Yankee fan sitting down and having the opportunity to talk to the son of Babe Ruth. You know what I mean? It's just well, you're. I mean, not to put them in the same realm, but because and your yeah. father, your father kind of pointed out in China Marine, he kind of feels because he is a member of a staggering low number of men who did not get wounded or died in those campaigns from the first Marine division. And he kind of mentions in here, he, he almost feels like it was because it was up to him to share the story, to get that book out. Yeah. And so because your father is one of, let's say seven voices of that era, at least in the mainstream, you know, vernacular, obviously there's a bunch of books on it, but we're mm -hmm. talking about in the mainstream realm, the realm of my normal 43-year-old counterpart who doesn't spend all their time producing podcasts and reading World War II stuff. The guy who's flipping through Spike TV or HBO and mm -hmm. sees the Pacific on his Amazon list for Band of Brothers. We're talking about those people. The fact that mainstream people who aren't in World War II know who your father is, is, you know, it's, it's kind of a big deal. Well, <clears throat> you know, I actually... And I can't remember, you know, we've texted back and forth a lot, Don. I can't remember if we talked about this or not. But so Sid Phillips, you know, was my dad's best friend. Mm -hmm. and that was on and, my list. And I read, and, and Jeff, I heard you plug in Adam Makos. Uh, Adam's a really good friend of mine. We worked together on a lot of stuff when the Pacific came out. But um, I am actually reading his book, Voices of the Pacific, right now and really enjoying it. Um, 
but Sid, Sid's talked to a lot. Yeah, you know, I grew up calling Sid Uncle Sid. Well, that's what uh, I was going to say to you as well, not to cut you off, is not only is your father E.B. Sledge, but your uncle is Sid Phillips. I mean, that's yeah. two people uncle, who I mean, put two, you know, yes, we, but we proverbial lived, uncle, but yes. Away, but it was always, you know, Uncle Sid. I mean, I never called him anything but that. Now, you know, we would go years and not see him. Uh, you know, when you're he's busy raising his family, my dad was busy with my brother and me, so, you know, but... Um, of course, when, when I did see him as a kid, I mean, we never talked about World War II stuff, but, you know, I did know that he and my dad were best friends and and all of that. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> but he he mentioned in Voices of the Pacific, it's actually on Valor Studios website. There is a letter, and I never even knew about this, that my dad wrote him in like 19, well, sometime back in the 80s, I guess, and Sid was talking about how, you know, we would go to First Marine Division reunions and Eugene would come up to my room and just because he was such a celebrity. And I'm telling you, if you knew my dad, there was nothing he would have hated more. And he just would go to Sid's room and hide out. He wanted to see his buddies, but, you know, everybody wanted to meet him and introduce him to their wives and all that. And, and he, he, he was a self, I mean, he could be very well-spoken and very outspoken. Um, uh, but just not at all self-aggrandizing, you know? Um, but, but there's, yeah, I remember that really well. There's gotta be a part of you. Cause I know, and, and believe it or not, we are getting down to that five minute mark. So we are going to take a break and then we'll, we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the Pacific. And then if you're okay. up for it, Henry, maybe we'll have you on the next episode and we can talk about some other stuff. Cause time just flies by so fast. I know, man. I feel like we've hardly gotten started. Exactly. And so maybe we'll, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll cover a little bit of the Pacific stuff and then we'll have you back for the next episode. If everybody's cool with that, I'm sure the audience will yep. be great, but there's gotta be a part of you now, all these years later, now that sadly Sid has passed as well, that when you fired up the Pacific this weekend, and there he is in living color and HD. There had to be a party that was so glad that he had the opportunity to sit down and have his image captured at the beginning of those episodes. Oh yeah. I mean, I remember the, in fact, the documentary that you played the clip from that was 1991. I remember when he and my mom went out of town to go do that. Uh, Cause Bill Layden was there. Bergen was there. Jay Delo was there. Um, I remember that really well. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, and it's kind of sad, but it does speak to being glad that my father did share those experiences, despite how emotionally eviscerating they were for him. You know, every time he would be interviewed for something, he would come home and I mean, he would be sick. Oh, I'm sure he, he would just be, you know, physically sick blood pressure would be all out of whack he'd be just you could just tell he was a mess and and he would get over it i mean you know the point was driven home and you really see it in the okinawa episode and part 10 where you know this this young man was just gutted as, as they all were and you know of course sid famously said oh just forget about all that can't dwell on it well you know, my dad did dwell on it and he dwelled on it to the point of writing, you know, a book and, or two books, if you want to be technical about it. But um, he carried a lot with him. But I mean, I, I want to because they talked about this in the Ken Burns thing, too. He don't ever think that it got the better of him. I mean, he conquered that. He got a Ph.D. in biology. He married a beautiful woman, my mom. He treated her like a goddess. Um he raised me. He raised my brother. I mean, he was a fantastic dad. We had a great relationship. He didn't burden us with any of that emotional baggage, if you will. Um, I mean, he did it right, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And I, I was just thinking, you know, your father's coming back from doing these interviews and these TV specials and all that uh, back in the 80s and 90s, because there's quite a few of them on YouTube. And yeah. you're talking about how he'd come home emotionally drained. And in the back of my mind, because I'm just fresh off of reading it, in the back of the book, he's saying that 
how he was able at a certain point to go to sleep at night is he had a recipe. He would sit there during when he was going to school to get his master's degree in biology. He would sit there and think about plants and animals and all that. And by, he said he would basically do an hour worth of research or an hour worth of studying at night. And then that would turn his dreams into biological stuff and not stuff right. the war. And so I'm thinking here is 1990s. He's already been a professor. He's already, I mean, he's already got his master's degree. He's already been doing his work and he's probably comes home and goes up and probably reads about biology for an hour just to subside all the thoughts that he just talked about for an eight hour recording session that day. Sure. So we are going to take a quick break. You guys hold tight there. Who's watching on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, we're going to make us a quick, quick turnaround, hold tight. And we will be right. And we are back from that quick interlude. If you guys want to help us support the show and help us prevent in the future from doing things like that, please head over to the WTSP World War II.com and sign up for Patreon. Patreon's a dollar a month. You can help support the show. You get access to exclusive content. And if you sign up for the $7.40 a month plan, you'll get a free t shirt after month two. And also, while you're at the website, WTSP World War II.com, go ahead and click on the social link and find our YouTube, our YouTube channel and subscribe to that. And as always, this episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast is brought to you by our friends at Computers. At Computers has been providing IT solutions for Southwest Florida since 2004. And even if you don't live in Southwest Florida, they can help you by giving them a call 239-283-1120 with your assistance as long as your internet works. Of course, they can run your computer and help you with all your computer programs. Now that we got all that stuff out of the way, let's get back to it. Uh, once again, we are here with Jeff and Henry Sledge. Jeff, do you have any... Uh, I'll let you go ahead and let's get into the Pacific television show side of this. And uh, you have any questions or lead ups for that you want to help toss in here uh you know i, I guess it's inevitable we're gonna have to talk about the mini series eventually with henry and i know nobody's asked him about it before <laughs> 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 um i i don't have anything uh specific i was actually hoping that uh maybe some of our listeners would kind of would creep in here and, and have a question about something with production or a detail here and there. Uh, I, I don't have any specifically. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well aware of, of that it, it intensive uh, project that it must have been. Um, and that there's people uh, like Mike Don and I, that if there is an accuracy, we're going to, we're going to point it out and, and be the ones to bring it to light, you know, as opposed to the right. it got right. You know, I, I try not to do that. You know, I, I try to, kind of, you know, uh, give everybody the, the benefit of the doubt. And like I said, I, you know, when, when Don mentioned about Dale Dye making that, uh, that call last Allegedly. minute, basically essentially changed the 1911 to a, to a revolver. Um, there's, there's gotta be some underlying reason why he did that, you know, and, and not that we may necessarily agree with it. Um, mm -hmm. but Hollywood is Hollywood and, you know, they've got, they've got an, uh, there, there had to be a reason. 
I don't think they just change history just to change history to be different. I could be mistaken, uh, but um, I appreciate what they do. And I did just want to say, Henry, that I wish uh, I wish I had the opportunity, and, and I truly, sincerely mean this, I wish I had the opportunity to thank your dad, not for what he did during the war, not for what he did when he got home from the war, but for giving the opportunity to the mainstream to know people like Ak Ak Haldane, the yep. guys that didn't come home. That Hillbilly. We would have never known who they were if it wasn't for people like your dad. Because I can tell you firsthand, the guys that come home, it's not who it has to be about. It has to be. Uh, so people will read your book. <laughs> they want to know your story. But I, I, I'm pretty certain your dad would feel the same way as I do, is to use him to know about the other boys that didn't come home. Because um, that's what everything was always about. And and I thank your dad for giving the people who have seen the miniseries, the people who have read his books or read Hugh Ambrose's book, to know about boys like that that didn't get the chance to come home and tell their story. Right. Uh, yeah, he he had, and he would have said the same thing: the heroes are the ones who didn't make it home. And if anybody's listening, I'm not listening because you won't be able to hear this until tomorrow. But if anybody's watching on YouTube or uh, Facebook, if you want, if you have questions for Henry, uh, we can try this. Give us a call at 239-299-3352. This will be your opportunity. And if you're a little gun shy, maybe send us an email to mail call at WTSPWorldWar2.com. And we'll read your questions for Henry the next time Henry comes on. Um, give us a, a brief rundown if you will you're you're explaining to me through uh phone conversations and text messages that one day you just got a call i believe from your brother saying hey um someone in hollywood's trying to gain rights to dad's book how did the whole thing come to play to your all's family um yeah 2004 and the the thing was somebody years ago and i, I don't remember if it was in the 80s or the 90s somebody had bought the film rights to it and wanted to do something with it <clears throat> Uh, and, and that never did get any traction. I'm but, so glad that that didn't come to fruition because just the way technology yeah. was and storytelling, it would have been, it wouldn't have been it nowhere what it is today. But yeah, it was 2004. Um, I had probably finished watching Band of Brothers for the 783rd time. And, uh, you know, of course, was very familiar with Saving Private Ryan and the whole, you know, Hank Spielberg treatment. And, and I mean, I can even remember having phone conversations with my brother about, man, I mean, I know World War II is not your thing, but God, you know, Saving Private Ryan and, and Band of Brothers, it was so powerful, so visceral. Can you imagine what it would be like if they did something with Dad's book? And, you know, my brother was like, man, the World War II has been done and done and done. I mean, it'll never happen. One well, more reason to 2004, do it. spring of 2004 to be exact, uh, my brother started getting some pings that um, people were making inquiries as to the film rights. And so we, we found out Bruce McKenna that he was interested in starting that process. And it was April of 04, I believe when my mother and I were flown out to Hollywood and we sat down with, and so was Sid Phillips, by the way. And we sat down and were interviewed and, and met with, Hugh Ambrose was alive at the time, uh, and he and Bruce McKenna. And and you know, really, <clears throat> despite I had some some mm, slightly contentious conversations with Bruce in the wake of the miniseries, or when it was, you know, you know about some some things that artistically were being done, but I mean, really, Bruce was the one, and he deserves the credit, you know. And, and I'm grateful to Bruce McKenna. 